I'm going to be talking about some joint work with the University of Bristol. I actually started this work as a, as a postdoc in, in 2012, um, developed a framework for um, assessing the Antarctica's contribution to sea level rise. Um, the University of Bristol still uses this framework and, and we're currently um, exploring ways to expand it. So um, this is still kind of work in progress, although this framework is now um, nearly a decade old now. Um, Right, so what's, what's the underlying problem? Um, what are we, uh, how are we solving this using some statistics? Um, maybe I should say I'm a statistician uh, at the University of Wollongong, um, and, but, but I've worked for, for two years uh, in the group of glaciology in Bristol, so, so I'm quite in, in tune with some of the problems um, based in, in cryospheric studies. Um, and then I'll talk about some, some results at the end of the talk. Right, so uh, the, main, the main thing we are tackling is sea level rise, uh, specifically sea level rise contribution from ice sheets. Um, Greenland and Antarctica are, of course, the, the biggest potential contributors of, of sea level rise. Um, Antarctica has the potential to contribute to about 60 meters um, of, of sea level rise. And I've got a picture down here showing what the UK would look like um, if all of Antarctica um, melted. Uh, that's not going to happen in our lifetime, of course, but it's still, it's still a shocking picture to see, um, you know, what, what, a, what a rise in sea level of 60 meters uh, could do. Um, right, so we wanted to model the Antarctic contribution to sea level rise, I must say the present day contribution, and quantify the uncertainty around those contributions. Um, so some basics, um, ice sheet processes, if they are in dynamic equilibrium, um, essentially what that means is that if precipitation equals ice discharge um, in the simplest of terms, then, then there's no sea level rise. Right? So we are really concerned about imbalance um, and an imbalance happens, again, keeping it very simple, when uh, snow accumulation exceeds or is less than the amount of loss. Okay, where losses could be due to calving, meltwater runoff, sublimation, and, and other lossy processes. Um, and the change in mass balance is actually what contributes uh, to sea level rise or sea level drop. And before we had satellites and remote sensing instruments, it was actually uh, quite difficult, and it still is actually very difficult to, to, to know what's, what's going on in Antarctica on a continental scale. So there are many data sets we could use um, to figure out what's going on. Uh, these are maybe the three main, three main classes. Uh, the first one is altimetry. Um, these could be from instruments on board, Envisat, ISAT, Cryosat. They can give us an idea on the, the change in, in surface height um, due to um, ice sheet processes. Okay, so red here, for example, is a drop in height over um, a period of time, and then blue here is a gain in height. Um, GPS stations, these can only be put on ice-free areas. Um, and as Steph said, there's only about 1% um, of that in, in Antarctica. Those can give us an idea on elastic rebound um, due to, for example, like, um, ice shelf collapse, but also more importantly due to a process called glacioisostatic adjustment, which is um, the slow uplift of, of bedrock um, due to the last glacial meltdown 10,000 years ago. Um, and then we've also got uh, gravimetry this is a very important um, measurement we could use, which gives us an idea of what the gravitational anomalies are. Uh, in general, if, if the ice sheet is losing mass, um, we can detect negative gravitational anomalies. And if where the ice sheet is gaining mass, we can detect positive gravitational anomalies. Um, we only have coarse resolution pictures of this, um, but still it's, it's very useful data to have. All right, so the problem in a nutshell is that uh, it's, it's, this is a very ill-posed problem. So for example, satellite altimetry detects height change, but we don't know whether that is due to precipitation, due to compaction of the ice, due to uh, basal melting of the ice, due to bedrock uplift. Uh, the same problem with when you detect a change in mass, we don't really know um, what contributes to, to an observation. Um, to put a bit of a picture to this, for example, let's say we hope have observations in 2003, 2009, and we want and we have observed some height change and some mass change. Uh, it could be that there was overall uh, positive precipitation anomaly, um, maybe a change in the fern densification rate, maybe an increase in base, ice basal melting, and an increase in, in mantle flow due to glacial isostatic adjustment, but 
we observe the total mass change and the total height change. Um, and to actually split these two components into um, what the four processes are doing is, is an ill-posed problem. Um, and uh, it's also, uh, in engineering, they call this problem source separation. Okay, so so we're, we're observing the, the total change, let's say, and we want to identify the individual uh, contributors to that change. <clears throat> so this is where um, a statistical model can really come in useful because uh, statistical models allow propagation of uncertainty. Uh, they will not give you a, a deterministic answer and say, okay, this is what's happening due to ice sheet uh, basal melting. This is what's happening due to increased precipitation. It will actually take that ill-posedness into account when coming up with solutions. Um, we we, we uh, describe um, these models uh, using what's known as a hierarchical spatiotemporal model. It's a bit of a mouthful, um, hierarchical, because we actually say we use a number of layers in our model. Um, in the first layer, we actually describe how the satellites and GPS and uh, whatever, how, how they are reacting, how, how, how the processes affect those measurements. So we can, for example, in this layer say that altimetry is measuring a sum of the four processes. Um, gravimetry detects a sum of three processes because densification is a massless process uh, and things like that. So this is where we map the processes to the observations. Um, in the second layer here, we, we mathematically write down how uh, with a prior model, we call it, on how these processes are evolving in space and time. Um, and uh, we put in knowledge, and I'll show you some, some, some pictures in the next slide. Uh, we incorporate prior knowledge in here. So we know, for example, that ice sheet dynamics tend to vary slowly in time, that uh, glacial isostatic adjustment is very smooth in space. So we can actually incorporate this uh, soft constraint knowledge in there too. And then there are some unknown parameters in these two models, and we can define some prior knowledge that we've got on those parameters in this third layer over here. Um, so this is what the observation layer looks like for, for this case study, which I'm going to talk about. Um, we had um, two, two altimetry satellites, ISAT and Envisat, gravimetry from the GRACE satellite and the bedrock uplift from GPS. Uh, we can say what processes these are detecting. Um, these are the number of observations we had. Um, and this is a symbol I'm using in this diagram over here. So we can literally say, okay, these are the four processes. These are the four sets of observations we have and actually draw arrows saying, okay, this, this satellite is measuring this stuff plus this stuff plus this stuff. But GPS, for example, is only measuring uh, the height change due to glacial isostatic adjustment. Um, and of course, we can write all, all of this down mathematically. Um, this is just a visual depiction of what's going on. Um, so that's the observation part. Uh, when we talk about how do we describe these processes, a key, a key um, thing that we tried to implement in this framework was that our inferences are mostly data driven. So we do not just take uh, regional climate model output and plug that in. We don't take a solid earth model output and plug that in. Um, we rather, we take simply features from those model outputs and use that to softly constrain our solutions. So some examples um, of what these are. So for example, surface mass, mass balance, think of precipitation and fern densification are locally correlated. Um, if you have an increased precipitation anomaly, you're going to have increased, increased fern densification at that point in space. Um, so we can actually code that into our model. Um, precipitation anomalies change to um, tend to change uh, rapidly in time. Okay, and again, we can put that in our model. Um, we know that ice dynamics generally change slowly in time, but especially in the coast, they change relatively quickly in space, and we put that in our model. And the glacial isostatic adjustment is temporally invariant um, over the time scales we are considering, and very smooth in space. And actually, and we put that into our model. So if we look at how we are partitioning, um, this is spectral space now, uh, things which are evolving slowly in space and slowly in time, essentially, we're going to say that that's glacial isostatic adjustment. Things that are evolving fast in time are going to be attributed to precipitation anomalies. 
uh, things which vary relatively slowly in time, but relatively quickly in space, especially near the coast. Um, th those who are probably due to losses due to ice dynamics. Um, and we can also constrain the ampl expected amplitude. So for example, we can use horizontal ice sheet velocities, sorry, horizontal ice velocities from INSAR to say where we expect um, high loss due to ice dynamics and where the ice is not moving at all. Uh, we say that the, 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 the chance that any loss is due to basal melting is nearly zero. Okay? And we, we can put that in our model as well. Um, to get soft constraints on the length scales of uh, glacial isostatic adjustment, we looked at numerical models. Uh, this is the IJ05 model output. Um, and here from, from these models, we basically got a feel that the, well, we actually estimated this, that the length scales are on the order of about 2000 kilometers. And we can encode that in our model. To get an idea on surface mass balance, we used RACMO 2.4. This is a regional climate model, um, heavily used for Antarctic studies. Um, run that, and we analyzed its behavior in space and time. And we could come up with these sorts of maps, which tell us what the temporal length scales are, the spatial length scales are, and the amplitude of the process, and how those vary in space in different places in Antarctica. OK, so of course, the peninsula, for example, has got a bigger um, precipitation anomalies and, uh, and actually smaller time scales. Um, underlying all of this, there's finite elements um, that we, and we actually solve for all the equations that we eventually write down on finite element meshes using some pretty sophisticated linear algebraic techniques. Um, not going to go into that now. All right, so just to conclude, um, I'll show you some, some, some results that we can get out of this framework. This is, for example, um, what our framework tells us is ice loss due to ice dynamics uh, between 2004 and, and 2009. Um, most notably here, we've got the Cambai stream, which is, um, there's a blockage there and ice is building up. Uh, we've also got places like Pine Island Glacier and Twaits Glacier, which uh, in, in this period, um, there was an acceleration in, uh, in horizontal speed and also in, in basal melting. Um, when it comes to surface mass balance, um, a nice thing about our framework is that we can actually validate regional climate models. Um, and since we haven't explicitly used the output in our uh, framework, um, we can literally plot what our, what we think is happening and what the climate model says is happening. And, and they are practically independent evaluations at this point. So um, the red here is what the climate model said is happening in surface mass balance. And the black here are what we call posterior distributions of what um, our Bayesian framework thinks is going on. Um, and overall, they don't always match up, but the overall trends um, are pretty similar, which is good. In time, in space, we notice very, um, very different results actually. Um, and we cannot reconcile our, our um, results with that of the regional climate model. When it comes to glacial isostatic adjustment, um, the total uh, mass change due to GIA, that ours was the rates project. Um, it is the most data-driven method in all these publications over here. We published ours in 2015. Again, very much in line with what the physical model um, have, uh, have reported. Um, and the last slide, uh, mass loss. Um, this is uh, our mass loss in the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, the red is excluding uh, gravimetry data. The black is including gravimetry data. And of course, in, in this period, 2003, 2009, it was a pretty dire situation. Um, and it's not just our publications which show this, but, but many other people as well. Um, it, uh, if, if, I'm, if I recall correctly, in recent years, it has slowed down a bit. Um, right, so uh, to conclude, um, this is a, what I showed you was a branch of multivariate spatial temporal statistics. Um, it has a lot to offer in a large range of environmental problems. Um, it allows us to consider major sources of uncertainty. Um, and one, one thing which comes out from this study is that actually having a diversity of measurements is much more important than having an abundance of one type of measurement, uh, because you need to tease out what's going on from the different processes by actually having mixtures of those processes, observing mixtures of those processes. Um, 
And we also have, haven't included numerical model output in our framework, but we've included features of the numerical model output, which is, which is very different. Um, and that allows us in some sense to validate the numerical model output. Um, and these are some, some papers from the project and um, that's it from me. Thank you.